Hi, welcome to 2020 War Room. This is Al Hunt. I'm with my pal and partner, James Carville, and we're going to talk a little bit of politics. But before that, every now and then we're going to have special counsels or consigliaries, smart people who'll make us look a lot smarter and a lot better than we are. And the first is one of the great experts on economics, Roger Altman, the CEO of Evercore, former deputy treasury secretary, uh, and I think the kindest and most generous billionaire that I have ever known and a dear friend. Roger, welcome to the podcast. I hope this doesn't hurt your reputation. No, but if I'm a billionaire, it's news to me. But thank you anyway. Well, we, we, we won't tell your wife. Okay. Um, <laughs> Roger, let's start the economy. Record Every month, it sets a new record for this economic spurt. We've never seen anything quite like it. Trump's numbers are held up by his approval ratings on the economy. He'd be below, he'd be in the high 30s if it weren't for that. Can this keep up for another 11 months? The answer is that it can, yes. That's not a certainty, as you would know. But right now, economic conditions just remain solid. We can all see how tight labor markets are. We have a 3.7% unemployment rate, which is the lowest in 50 years. Uh, We have consistent job growth. It has slowed some, but it's still clicking in at about 150,000 jobs a month, which at this very late stage of this expansion, this is now a a nine-year expansion. And of course, uh, there's no sign of inflation or other imbalances that would precede a recession. Now, are there any storm clouds on the horizon? Yes, there are. And the biggest one is the rest of the world. If we'd been having this conversation a year ago, we might have been talking about a term uh, synchronized global growth, which referred to the fact that the world as a whole seemed to be recovering, not just the United States. Today, it's the opposite. The United States continues to be solid, but the rest of the world, at least in terms of the major economic regions, is weaker than we are. Uh, China is still very strong and growing at a, at, a, at a rate that would be handsome for most other countries, but it has slowed down a lot. Europe is a bit better, perhaps in the last two months, but still barely growing. And many other large countries, especially the big emerging markets, Russia, Brazil, and so forth, are very weak. So one storm cloud is that the rest of the world is slow, and we're Uh, rather alone. Uh, And China's a bit of a special case because it's still growing nicely, but way down from where it was. Uh, And of course, uh, there are various things that could happen around the world which could undermine our recovery. One obvious one is that our exports slow way down uh, as the rest of the world slows. But in any event, that's one storm cloud. But, But you'd have to say that if you look ahead for the next... 12 months, because this is November and a year year from now is election month, the prospect that the economy remains, number one, on a growth track rather than flat or retreating, and number two, that the labor market conditions we're seeing today more or less continue, that prospect is a good one. So therefore, uh, and I'll turn it over to John Maynard Carville in just a second, but give me what the odds are, what, what the people up there say, the odds are up there being Wall Street in New York. Uh, the probabilities are for any kind of a recession or downturn next year? It's probably 25%. Mm -hmm. Uh, And why would it be that high? Because this is now the longest expansion in the modern history of the United States, the longest recovery period at nine years without a recession. And even though, as uh, uh, many economists say, Recoveries do not die of old age. They suffer from some imbalance or exogenous shock that ends them. Uh, But it is long in the tooth. That's number one. And number two, we've had, since we began this recovery in 2009, three mini recessions, three times during that nine-year period when the economy slowed down a lot. uh, And it looked like we might be on the verge of actually going negative, which would mean recession, but we never quite did. Uh, So there have been moments during this nine-year period when it looked like the growth was over. So I would say about 25%. My own view is um, that's about right in terms of percentage uh, because the the base case is 
the economy will continue to grow. Yes, it may grow in some quarter at one and a half or one and a quarter percent instead of two percent, and that labor markets, the unemployment rate, the job growth creation rate, and so forth, will remain about the same. Any given month can always be an outlier, and we may see some of those because we often do. But I think on balance, the outlook is pretty solid. And if I was uh, in the White House and focused on re-election, I would think that the outlook is going to be helpful to us. So when I came in, in, in national politics and, you know, when, when President Clinton was elected and even before that, it was all of the deficit. And we went through, we bled, we had to have a five cent increase in the gas tax because the markets needed reassurance that we were fiscally responsible. Then we ran the surpluses and we were all proud of that. And then Bush came, and then, you know, Pete Peterson spent a billion dollars and then they had the Desert Commission, they had Erskine and Senator Simpson and the Tea Party, and we were gonna all die and the deficit was gonna kill us all. And then all of a sudden, no one cares about the deficit. Not not the Democrats, certainly not the Republicans, the the economists, the the the, the deficit scrolls. Of, no one even pays any attention to them anymore. Uh, what happened? Why why we were worried about something that no one is worried about now? Well, that's a good question, uh, and the answer is uh, in two parts, at least in my t- my two cents. One is the world has been stunned by the progress of interest rates. Um, we, have the, we have interest rates around the world, which are in many, in many places the lowest ever, ever recorded. And obviously we have interest rates in the United States that are at rock bottom histor- levels by historical standards also. Now, going back two years, three years and earlier, nobody forecasts this, at least nobody that I know. The general mentality two or three years ago and earlier was the next move in interest rates is up as the world recovers, demand for capital increases, inflation begins to pick up with that recovery and so forth. And so there's been a stunning, unexpected and profound development in terms of the level of interest rates. Why is that an answer to your question? Because with interest rates this low, the cost of borrowing for the United States, and for that matter, almost everybody else, is much lower than expected. And for example, the interest expense share of the budget or the interest expense share of GDP is way below what what everyone thought. So if you were in the US Treasury today, James, you would probably say, we ought to borrow all the money we can on something like a 50-year basis, because we could borrow 50-year money in the vicinity of two and a half percent, and we'll never see that again, and we should take advantage of it. So one argument against, the one reason that people are not concerned about the deficits is because the cost of those deficits is way lower than anybody thought, and with huge challenges facing this country, like climate, where the right kind of climate program would involve a lot of spending, uh, and like and, and other other challenges we have from education to healthcare and so forth. But but but, but uh, Roger Roger, they're spending they're spending money on stock buybacks. All right, they're not spending the money on on climate. Well, you're referring to corporations. Well, yeah. I, no, but the tax the tax you're, cut. You're referring the tax to com- cut co- corporations. Was, went to corporations and and according to all the research I've seen, they didn't increase research and development or anything. That they, they, they used it and they bought stock back and increased the stock price, and. Of course, with unemployment at three point seven percent. Well, you're talking. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're talking to somebody who, you're talking to somebody who thinks that tax cut was a big mistake. Okay. Uh, you know, we did not need a twenty one percent corporate tax rate. In fact, the business community, by and large, wasn't even asking for that tax rate. We were earlier at thirty five. We needed to go, for example, in the eyes of the business roundtable, pretty pretty centrist. I mean, pretty central business group to twenty eight percent and. The president and the Congress decided, why not 21? We didn't need that that kind of tax cut for corporations. We didn't need the rest of it, much of which meant went to high earners and wealthy, wealthy and the wealthy. We didn't need it. So that tax cut was a mistake. Now, your point about stock buybacks is correct. Stock buybacks, I I think are have gotten way out of hand, um, and 
you ask me what we ought to do about it, I would say we should have a requirement that companies that would like to do buybacks have to invest an identical amount to that which they want to buy back into their workforces. So if you want to spend a dollar on buybacks, you have to spend a dollar on your workforce. That's either wages or benefits or both or other other uh, strengthening of your workforce. Well, you know, I think that's a, that's a good proposal. I'm waiting to hear that on the campaign show. Maybe we have. Roger, the other thing, I mean, tax cut uh, didn't work. Uh, we found that out. The other conventional wisdom um, maybe a year or so ago was that this China trade war could be disastrous for the economy. I, I think it's a mistake. I think it's problematic. I think we spent $28 billion already bailing out farmers. That's more than we did in the auto bailout. But the China trade war really hasn't hasn't had these great repercussions, has it? Well, at least for the America. Yeah, but I don't America. think I don't think wise people uh, or a few wise people were saying that the trade war would be disastrous for the economy. I think there was there were some who thought it would destabilize financial markets, and that in turn could have a you know knock on effect in terms of the economy as a whole. But if you step back and ask yourself a simple question. What's the export share of the U.S. economy? It's 12%, very low. And therefore, even if our, our, our exports to China went to zero, um, uh, what effect would that have on the U.S. economy? And the answer is it would not be catastrophic. So it was never the case that in sort of narrow economic terms, a trade, a trade dispute with China with relatively small amount of our economy dependent on exports to China, and of course there are important sectors like the agriculture sector where it's important, but overall, it was never did never had the potential all by itself to destabilize our economy. Now, uh, I think it's the wrong thing to have done from both China's point of view and our point of view. I mean, tariffs have never particularly been effective. They're damp. They're 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 they, they hurt consumers. Because in a real in, they're taxes, yeah, they're taxes, and, and they're passed on to consumers, and they hurt consumers. And nobody who shops at Walmart is going to benefit from tariffs on Chinese products. In fact, it's the opposite; they're going to pay more. But um, uh, I'm not surprised myself that it hasn't destabilized the economy because the the share of our economy that's dependent on China is so small. So, uh, so uh, you uh, have, have not endorsed anybody in the presidential race. Is that am I correct? Yes, that's right. that's right. So has Senator Warren come up with the unrealized capital gains tax? Do you, do you know if that's one of her proposals? Well, she's, she, has, she has proposed, she has proposed um, mark to market, a mark-to-market capital gains tax, or some people call it an accrual approach. What it means is that each year, whether you sold the investment or you held it, you would mark it to market, meaning you would value it. And if you had a gain in it, whether you intended to sell it or not, you have to pay tax on the implicit gain. Now, by the way, I happen to think that's a pretty good idea. Uh, but that's one of the things she has proposed. She's also, she's also proposed much higher capital gains tax rates. Um, I, think she's, I think she's proposed, I might have to check this, but I believe she's proposed the capital gains tax rates should be a, should be the same as ordinary income tax rates, and that both should be higher than they are today, a lot higher. Um, but I'm not certain about homes, but they would apply to all forms of investment. I I suspect that homes would eventually get carved out, even if she hasn't done that, because they're not really investments in in the normal sense of the term, and I don't think they would end up being included. And I'm not sure what she said on it, but I think for practical purposes that would not be part of it. But everything else. You know, would be a second home. You know, a a, a uh, I don't know whether what a, a piece of art, a, a classic car, whatever your favorite thing is, they would all be subject to this. So, so maybe I don't understand it, but let's say I have ten thousand dollars in stock in in in, in General Motors, at, and it, that that's what it's worth on on January first. On December thirty first, it's worth fifteen thousand. I, I I didn't sell it. But I, do I have to pay the capital gains on the five thousand? Yes. So every year, every year in an investment, 
you got you don't have to just beat the market. You're going to have to if you pay tax, capital gains tax the same as ordinary income. And under Warren, or even me would say it ought to be in the high 40s or 50. So every year you're going to be paying 50 percent on your gain, even though you didn't sell it. Uh, that seems a little burdensome to me, but I don't know. <laughs> well, pretty aggressive. I think it would be very burdensome. I think it would be very burdensome when it came to stuff that isn't liquid. You know, with a stock, you can all see what it's worth and there's no complexity as to what, what you bought it at and where it's trading now. But if you're talking about- What do you do in art? Well, or, or take, a, take a small business. Let's say the three of us decided to start a small business. And now it's a year after we started it. What is that business worth? Well, that's really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat in the business of valuations and, you know, transactions. Deciding what a one-year-old business is worth is often right, you know, next to impossible. I think there'd be very, very difficult issues like that. However, when it comes to securities, you know, liquid trading securities, I don't have a problem with her idea. And what she's really trying to get at is, you know, we have a system in this country where, James, if you take your General Motors and you bought it, let's say, 30 years ago, and then it ends up in the hands of uh, your children and nobody has paid any tax right. on it and you have a huge gain, there's something ultimately wrong with that because the people who have the, the resources to make investments like that in the first place end up avoiding taxes and the people who you know, have all W-2 income don't. My, of course, our, my children would only pay from what it was when I died. So if I held it, if it went from $1 to fifty dollars. Yeah, but the but the inherit but the but the but the yeah, but the estate tax is so gutted, is so right. toothless I, that you'd have to have a heck of a large estate. Right, right. But for that but, not but to be the, exempt. The larger point. The other well, point, well, okay. well. Also, uh, if if you adopt right. Warren's mark to market capital gains on assets, uh, Roger, it would really uh, you know vitiate or eliminate the need for capital gains of death, wouldn't it? Because you'd be taxing them all along. Yes, as a as a, as a theoretical matter, it would. Um, so, I want to go back to the other example to just because I think this is so I buy the stock at one. I die. The stock is at it, the stock is at 50. All right. My children sell the stock at 60. They they don't they only pay capital gains on it from, on it going from 50 to 60. The the, the whole that's right. Acceleration from one dollar to fifty dollars is completely untaxed. Is that correct? Right. Which is unsound. Right. OK. I, I just, I, you know. That's not a good system. Except, I think, Roger, that's absolutely right, except on um, on residences or property. I mean, you only, I mean, don't you, on you primary, get a 500,000 yeah. exemption. Primary residences, yes. Uh, but, yeah. But, but, it's, but, James, you put your finger right on it. Um, uh, you know, Senator Warren and a lot of other people would say, I happen to agree with them, that a system where you buy General Motors shares 50 years ago, and you could buy them 50 years ago, and uh, they've gone up a great deal, and your children only pay tax on the difference between the the stepped up basis they got at your death right. and whatever the price is when they sell it. That's a screwed up system. I think it is screwed up. A conservative economist one time said that uh, the uh, state tax or lack of the estate tax is affirmative action for the rich. Uh, yeah, and it really is. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Roger, Roger, before we go, uh, let me just ask you this: We talked about Warren a little bit. Um, uh, Michael Bloomberg threw his hat into the ring uh, this week. He threw his hat into the ring with an awful lot of cash in it. Uh, he is the former mayor of New York. He has been, I think, uh, considered, you know, um, uh, at least he's he is, is held in high regard by many people on Wall Street and the financial community. What was the reaction to Bloomberg's entry? Well, I think there are reactions from two very different communities. There's the community of politically active people, including donors, on the one hand, and there's a reaction from everybody else on the other. I think you're asking me about the first community. And the answer is the answer is that most people in that community that I know don't believe there's a path, a pathway for Mike to get from here to the nomination, and therefore they're very, very skeptical, including that he's starting so late, including that he's skipping the first four states. Um, and, and so it, it, I think the main reaction was tremendous skepticism. Having said that, I want to speak for myself. I'm happy he's in the race, and I'm happy he's in the race 
because I believe, based on press accounts, that he's going to spend a lot of money on what I would call party building and election building. I mean, he's already announced they're going to do a major voter registration effort in five states, and that's going to help Democrats in those states, apart from him. Um, And I think he's going to do a lot more work like that in addition to his own candidacy. And that is to the good, because that increases the chances of defeating President Trump, and it increases the chances of electing Democrats. Um, So I'm glad he's in the race. And all these theories about, well, he hurts Biden and he helps Warren and, and Bernie, uh, most of that conventional wisdom is usually wrong. Uh, and so I don't, I don't pay a lot of attention to that. I mean, and the other point is, now, you know, I, I, I agree that the pathway from Mike to get from here to the nomination is really, really steep. But give him credit. He would be a good president. In fact, he'd be a gr- very good president. Now, you know, if you said to me, Roger, bet $10,000, uh, even money on, on Mike, one way or the other, I think I'd have to bet against it because the probabilities are low. Everybody knows that. Mike knows that. But I I think he'd be a very good president. I think he's going to do a lot of what I call party and election building, and I'm glad he's in the race. Uh, Well, I mean, look, everybody has one assumption, and that is that Biden will collapse. There's only about 10 people waiting waiting for him to collapse and catch what they can, and and, uh, certainly Mayor Bloomberg is, is one of them. Uh, it, it it's kind of he's always been cautious about this and he's going in and you know I, I just think this lends to my idea that it's going to be a very volatile year and things are going to happen that we can't predict and we can't expect and sometimes you just got to sit back and let them come to you but but I, I think this process is very early and I think it has a really long way to go and it's in and, and nothing is certain right now even the fact that Mike Bloomberg can't win, I, I agree. It, it's highly unlikely, but yeah, it's very well. We all, I well you listen. I look at both of you guys is. know better that both of you guys know better than me that on this date, in this p- precise date, um, in 2008, Barack Obama was not le- was not in the lead for the Democratic nomination, and on this precise date in 2004, John Kerry wasn't in the lead for the nomination, and on this precise date, God knows, James knows. In 1991, Bill Clinton was not in the lead for the right. Democratic nomination. So yeah. what does that tell you? It tells you what James just said. This is going to go through a series of phases uh, that, that aren't evident to us now. And n- the candidates don't know, I don't think God knows, how it's going to turn out. I would point out the levels of engagement in this cycle are so much higher than they were even in 08 or, or 92 or, or in 04. James, let me ask you a question. Sure. I went to a, went to a conference uh, a week ago today, and I heard our, our old friend Rahm Emanuel predict that the total vote cast in the 2020 presidential election would be between 20 million and 30 million votes higher than in 2016, and it would be the highest turnout in the United States since 1908. And I wonder if you will, broadly will, speaking, I, th- agree yeah, with I, that. I, I do agree with it, and the reason he said it because I told him. Uh, <laughs> uh, Albert and I, we're gonna, Albert and we're I gonna interviewed. Give there's, time. A, there's actually a guy at, at, at the University of Florida, and Ron and I have talked to this by the name of Mike McDonald. We interviewed him when we had our, our old Periscope thing. And I, I think I'm right here. There's 136 million that voted in 2016. McDonald thinks it's going to be between 155 and 160 million. So that I mean, Rom's a little bit on the outside. He's saying it'll be somewhere between the 19 and 24 million increase, which is also pretty staggering. Now that's the last time I looked. I, I it, 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 okay. And I got another. Resource, I have another question for you. Since I'm now doing the podcast, I've now captured the podcast. Right. My question is. If it's let's just pick a number. Let's say 25 million more people vote yeah. in 2020 than 2016. Right. That would be a good thing for the United States, by the way. Maybe. My question is, does that 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 giant turnout benefit uh, Mr. Trump, or does it benefit the likely Democratic nominee, whoever she is? The answer is both. <laughs> that the answer is, we're not sure, but I would take the crapshoot. Uh, you know, he does get out. He does get out whites who, who won't come out for other people and he does and there are people that he gets that love him that don't much care about the republicans don't much care about voting however 
as we saw in Louisiana, which was instructive, we only got 20, probably 27 percent African-American share in the first round. And then we learned to use Trump's visits. We learned to do different things. And we got it up to over 30 percent share in the second round. If you look at what happened with, 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 with Doug Jones in Alabama, you had a boy, boy, Trump got people out that didn't normally vote, but you, you had an unbelievably high African-American turnout. What you have to counter this with is like hard work and, and getting your vote out in the right places. And that, that's the places like North Carolina, there's places like Florida, you know, there's places like that, you know, we know where, the, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan, we know where they are. And it, 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 you just can't let things take their own course because he will go out and he'll get them out. But I think what we learned in, in Louisiana, I'd known it before, is if you let his visits go unattended, he will get a spike in rural whites. But what we, we saw in the runoff is we had an equal spike with, with, with people in Orleans Parish. And you had also you had a spike of, of these college educated uh particularly as college-educated women. I mean, the, the, the patterns that were taking place nationwide were even reflected in a place like Louisiana and, and Kentucky also. So we, we, we did learn something uh, in leading up to 2020. And, and we did. Roger, I, I, I think, I mean, going along with what James said, if there is that surge and it takes place in North Carolina and Florida and some other places, it's going to likely help the Democrats. If it takes place in Wisconsin, it could help Trump because there may be some non, a number of non-college educated whites who didn't vote last time. So it kind of depends on where it is. But I, I agree with James on balance. Uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd take the chances and it'll help Democrats. Our, our economic consigliere, Roger Altman, has elevated us considerably, James. Thank you, Roger. That's it. Thank you, guys. James, uh, anything on your mind? Well, uh, Rudy Giuliani, the story in the Post, when he went to Spain, he stayed at the estate of a Venezuelan energy magnate facing money laundering and bribery probe in the U.S. So if we add that to Lev and Igor, and we get, we're getting a real, real good picture of who uh, America's mayor is, aren't we, Albert? A real good picture. Yeah, uh, yeah, we are. Um, you know, that's, um, boy, uh, Rudy. Uh, Rudy, we hardly knew you. Uh, I think uh, Rudy, as the saying goes, better lawyer up a lot now, James. I don't mean a little bit. He better lawyer up a lot. I, I, I completely agree. And, I, you know, I don't I don't know of anybody in this whole saga that's fallen further than him. I, I mean, people in jail, but but Paul Manafort was at one time. Rudy Giuliani was a, a really big deal in the United States. I mean, a really big deal. He was America's mayor. He was the hero of 9-11. Right. He, At one point, he was considered the front runner for the Republican nomination, even though I think that was false, but he was considered he, that. He was a man that was credited with, you know, I mean, causation, correlation. When he was U.S. attorney, a lot of mobsters went down. Right, and right. I, it, there's some, I don't, something ha- I think the guy's just a drunk. I don't know what happened to him. Well, he certainly uh, maybe maybe he's that. Maybe he just craves attention, uh, and maybe he couldn't stand being a has-been. But the fact that he's being investigated and potentially actions brought against him by the office that he used to head uh, is more than a little bit of irony. You know, James, you focus on the big picture. I I got another question. All right. Earlier this week, Trump and Mike Pence uh, trotted out Conan. Conan was the dog that supposedly went after and captured and helped kill uh, the, uh, the terrorist over the ISIS terrorist. Do you really think that was Conan? How do we find out? I have I have my suspicions that that was a fake job. Well, I, you know, but you got to acknowledge something. A broken clock is right twice a day, right? Then maybe they by fault, default they're telling the truth. That's the only way it would happen. If you just it was the time and you just happened to walk in right where the clock was there. But I don't can't can I can't think of anything that they tell the truth about. So I don't know why this would be one of them. Well, that's right. The broken clock theory is you know is probably uh, is is probably the best defense. And you know I would not. I mean I really don't like this, but it shows you what he's like. Melania Trump, who you know may may probably is the most appealing member of that whole group. Uh, you know you can't blame a woman for uh, you know making for a bad marriage. Um, but uh, she got booed in Baltimore. Uh, it's just, um, 
If you're not a Trump person, you're a Trump hater in this country. Yeah, you know, the, 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 how much this thing is permeated in, into society. This is a story that I never thought I'd see. In Gainesville, Georgia, right, they, uh, the police raided a young person and found all of these weapons, and she was going to shoot all these people up and everything. And it was a 16-year-old female. No, female. A 16-year-old female. I mean, that that's how... This stuff is just permeated the country everywhere. I mean, it's one thing, you know, it's horrible and get started on these, these males that, that do this, but, you know, you wouldn't you would have thought that a female would be into this. And, and the, uh, it's just, it's a, it's a, what's happened in the United States is, is a, it, it, it's just a tragic beyond belief. It, it, it really is. And it, yeah, it is. And, and James, as you know, we had hate before, we had violence before we had terrible people terrible things but what trump has done is he's emboldened those elements he has given them license yeah we've had hate before but you know the the people would speak out against it i mean we were appalled when the charles whitman and the you know the university of texas tower and you know you you had that kind of stuff but the president would come out the the, the you know everybody would come out with trump he he's not particularly you know he met nice people on both sides. What, what's the big deal here? I mean he gives he, we we've never had a president that gives aid and comfort to to people like this. I mean we've had them before, not as many, but but now half the people in the world might agree with him. For all I know, I mean it's just it's that it's that crazy. Uh, and of course I'm teaching. I did a course the other day on great political speeches and political rhetorics and try to pick different types. And one of the types uh, that I picked for, for, for president uh, was the consoler in chief. It was Obama and Charleston. It was Reagan and the challenger, Bill Clinton at Oklahoma City, George Bush with the bullhorn. Can you, I can't imagine, I can't imagine uh, Donald Trump being a consoler in chief doing any kind of tragedy because, you know, he doesn't have any empathy for anyone but himself. Okay, so just you, you, you think Trump can't be any dumber or, or more narcissistic or egomaniacal than he is, right? Well, I'm, I'm going to read something because it's from my friend Jonathan Shade. He said, yesterday, President Trump signed a woman's suffrage centennial commemorative coin act the effect of which is self-explanatory. It creates a coin to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment ratifying women's suffrage. Or at least it's self-explanatory to everybody except Donald Trump, who is mystified as to why the 100th anniversary was not recognized earlier. After working his way through the prepared remarks, Trump interjected with his own You're whip. making this up. I, they've, they've been working on this for years and years, he said, suddenly wondering. And I'm curious, why wasn't it done a long time ago? And also, well, I guess the answer to that is because now I'm president and we get things done. We get a lot of things done that no one else got done. I, I mean, everybody stop, chew, and think about that. That that Before he was president, we didn't acknowledge the centennial of the 19th Amendment. I mean, I, what are we? I bet the he, contribution, the contribution, the contributions that we have country, failed to appreciate. And, and a man that really, that's a man that cares about women too. And you got Marsha Blackman. Uh, the task of explaining to Trump that centennial means the hundredth anniversary fell to Republican Senator Marsha Blackman. Blackman generally re recounted the bill, worked its way through both chambers of commerce, Congress, as usually with blah 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 that, that passed. But it, it solved it, and he now understands what a centennial is. I think I don't know that. Well, listen, he, I don't know that either, but the one thing he does understand, he understands the importance of veterans, the importance of heroes, the importance of the chain of command, and the importance of ignoring all of the above and overriding everyone and giving a presidential pardon and then refusing the Navy to go and, and act on its own against this Navy SEAL uh, who committed some bad acts. That just is, that is such an insult to the military and everybody well, who has he, served. He's wrecked so everything on. else. Why not the military? He's wrecked the State Department. That's true. He's wrecked the CIA. Yep. He's wrecked the FBI. He's wrecked the EPA. He's wrecked the Justice Department. Trying to wreck Department. the Federal Reserve. He's, he's trying to wreck the Federal Reserve. He's wrecked the Interior Department. I mean, uh, what else you need? I mean, he just, he, just anything that's there that he sees... He's just got to destroy it. 
in, in the military is next in line. Well, I'd like to think of something nice to say about him for Thanksgiving, but I can't even I can't even operate under the theorem of a broken clock is right twice a day and think of something nice to say about him, uh, or much less two. So you know what we're going to do, James? We're going to turn over to that younger woman who loves to make uh, or loves to challenge. Let's put it this way: uh, septuagenarians. Uh, she's our own Jimmy the Greek. She throws numbers at us. Christy, the numbers, Harvey. Harv, what do you have for us today? Hey, fellas, uh, you've got Christy here. So my first number this week is 25%. Uh, This is the number that Donald Trump is claiming that public support for impeachment has fallen to, down from 75%. But the problem is nobody can find the poll. Uh, The pollings remained pretty steady through CNN, through Gallup, through NBC, at about 43% uh, disapproving of impeachment, not 25%. um, approving of it. So, uh, James, this is my question to you as all of your experience as a pollster. Um, should we just get throw polling out the window and just start making these numbers up? It seems to work for the president. Well, he just says what whatever he wants the truth to be. He, he says it, even though it's not the truth. And, and 40% of the country will probably believe him. And when 60% are told it's a lie, they will shrug and say, well, What's new about that? There's, that's the number 14,000, I think it is. I, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's stunning that we've reached a point where he just stands up, ball-facedly says it. Of course, somebody like you calls it out. We discuss it. And, yeah, he lied again. And, every you know, everybody with an IQ above the temperature of ditch water knows that he's lying. And everybody with an IQ below the temperature ditch water thinks he's telling the truth. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would point out that he's not the only one that fabricates numbers. Remember that old Clinton aide, Dickie Morris? He was infamous for making up numbers. He was infamous for a lot of things, any, but, You know, actually, the polling the polling news is, is – the real polling news is actually depressing to me. CNN and the Morning Consult – Survey suggests there's still a plurality for in, for impeachment. Unlike what Trump said, um, you know, it hasn't changed. But these very compelling hearings really didn't move the needle. The Trump party is sticking with Trump. And don't confuse me with the facts or the evidence. What else do you have, Christy? Maybe his role as the chosen one will save him on this. And that's the number of biblical figures that Rick Perry trotted out uh, while telling Trump that he does believe that he's God's chosen one. Uh, He pointed out that not all people chosen by God to be great leaders have been perfect and cited in a, a recent interview with Fox and Friends, biblical characters like King David, Saul, and King Solomon as other biblical figures who were chosen but not always perfect. Albert, what do you think about that one? Well, I don't know. Who were the other chosen two, Christy? I mean, <laughs> Harvey Weinstein, maybe Hannibal Lecter. I don't know. Um, uh, that's. Uh, but now let me give Secretary Perry a little credit. He's getting better. He really is. Remember, uh, he remembered King David, Saul, and Solomon. But back in 2011, when he was running for president, he proposed to eliminate three federal agencies But when asked, he could only remember two. And the one he forgot (laughs) was the Department of Energy, which he now (laughs) supposedly heads. Well, I'm sure that he got he got his information from, you know, two Corinthians. Uh, (laughs) You know, if one of the things that has really been illuminating here. I, I, I love these guys that, that the William Bars and, and particularly you find a lot of these conservative Catholic people demeaning the, the role that the church doesn't play in the community and that, you know, government should boast the, the, the role of religion. Well, are you, do you have any idea why if, if a young person looks at Jerry Falwell or looks at Franklin Graham or looks at Jesse DePlantis or looks at Joel Osteen, or looks at the Catholic Church and looks at Bernard Law. Could there be any reason is maybe that we're not seeing that is causing young people to not be so enamored with religion, like like Attorney General Barr would like them to be? Uh, it, could there, is is something going awry in 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 the space of religion? Because it sure seems to me like it. And, and they they come back after producing. You know, after Cardinal Law being a hero of all heroes and then taking all of these, you know, right wing people supporting them 
and they, they blame the public for what happens and not the hierarchy of these inherently corrupt institutions. It, it just it, it drives me crazy. It's just like none of this ever happened. It's just a country of, of selfish people that, that, that don't understand the importance and role of the, the organized religion in, the, in their lives. It's a, it, I mean, it, it, these people have no... I, 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 I don't know if they really believe that or just, they just say it because it just is something they all have, have always said. Yeah, well, maybe maybe William Barr ought to just stick with being uh, the president's attorney general rather than the countries and stay off all this other stuff. Christy, do you have anything a little bit lighter for us? Yeah, not much, though. Um, this week is Thanksgiving, and I read a study that showed that most people over the course of their Thanksgiving day, whether it's turkey, stuffing, cranberry sauce, pie, what have you, will ingest about 4,500 calories. Uh, that's the equivalent of sitting down and making your way through eight Big Macs. So just wanted to say happy Thanksgiving and see what you guys had in store uh, for both your calorie consumption and uh, working those calories off. I don't, I don't, I'm not a big thanks. I, I love Thanksgiving. I love the games. I love the friendship and everything. I, I don't much like turkey. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not like giblet gravy and, and that kind of stuff, but I'm going to make some hop and John. I'm bringing up a Three sacks of Louisiana oranges is by the way the best citrus in the world. It's very limited, so I'll make a you know eat a lot of oranges, a lot of orange juice, a lot of I have a bucket load of bourbon. I got some really nice red wine. I went and picked me out a uh, some nice margos, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Now what I usually have is I don't eat the turkey. I'll, maybe I'll get a little tenderloin and some popping john and some green beans and not in a nice salad. And I'm ready to go. Well, if, if 4,500 is the over-under, I'll take the over, and that doesn't count the booze. But I, I, I like Thanksgiving. I mean, we spend it this year with family and friends. My son Benjamin's best friend, Daniel Von Hook Stratton, Molly Von Hook Stratton, coming from Columbus, where he does God's work for the Democratic Party out there, bringing their three-month-old little boy and our two-year-old grandsons going to show this kid the ropes. Nothing like an older man to tell you what's going to happen. So I'm really looking forward to Thanksgiving. Christy Harvey, you have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, guys. As always, always fascinating stuff, Miss Harvey. You're a great mathematician. Man. Get, you know, Walter Isaacson to do your biography of you. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> Okay, James, quickly, uh, let's just do the back page. I'm going to, I'll repeat a little bit, but, you know, as a Watergate watcher, reporter back in the 70s, I, I thought back and I worried that this scandal, even with all the awful stuff, Trump hotel meetings and over in Ukraine, it didn't have the same nefarious characters as back then. But then you think about Rudy Giuliani and his two indicted associates, Joe DeGeneva, once, like Rudy, a respected attorney, his always angry wife, Victoria Tunzing, the discredited former chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunes, and his hitman, Derek Harvey. You know, they're starting to make Gordon Liddy look good. Yeah, I mean, and in, in, in all of the other ancillary characters around here, like, th there is not one shred of doubt about the basic charge that he tried to use his power to leverage a foreign government to announce an investigation of a political opponent. From what I understand... They never really cared if they investigated Joe Biden or anything. They just wanted to announce it, so he'd have to have something to go repeat on on, on Fox. So, if, if you if you want to argue, yeah, he did it, but we're not going to overturn an election, but or with an election coming up in in ten months. But the answer to that is is the reason you impeach him with an election coming up in ten months because he is trying to rig the election. He's trying to rig that one. Yes. Right. He's right. trying to the one going forward. He, he wasn't. He didn't learn his lesson from having people rig it for him in 2016 at at, at a minimal. He wants to rig it himself. I, I it, it's it's so stunning when you see that. And and again, I, I there is no doubt as to what the facts are. That I mean, if they, I, no one can even argue the facts. Well, I you know I certainly agree, uh, and I hope all of you. We'll be listening as you're enjoying those 4,500 plus calories. Thank you for listening to 2020 Politics War Room with James Carville and me, Al Hunt. Please subscribe, rate, and review, be generous, the podcast on Apple Podcasts. 
This has been terrific. Everybody have a happy Thanksgiving. We'll talk to you all soon. This is Al Hunt saying goodbye.